Uh, welcome, everyone, to the uh, uh, super yachts are coming. Uh, are you ready? It sounds a little bit alarmist, almost, the, uh, the title there, but uh, what we're talking today uh, with, the, with the panel who I'll introduce to, uh, to you in the moment is really about what's coming up in the next few years from major events to uh, the um, potential changes in legislation, government legislation, which are going to create some significant opportunity in this space. So uh, that, that's that's the, the, the background of, uh, of the discussion. And, and uh, to my left here is uh, is a panel of, uh, of people that have uh, varying experiences in the industry, uh, starting over with uh, Mark James, who is a, a, a super yacht captain uh, and for over 20 years uh, uh, did uh, captain boats in the, in the med, the uh, Caribbean uh, and uh, in various other uh, regions which uh, are around those, those areas in the exploration. Uh, Clemens Overdijek has uh, been in the industry for, he's how long, 20 years now? Yeah, it would be. Uh, starting, coming over from the food and beverage sort of industry into marinas with the Del Bora Group and spent a long time there. I worked with Clemens myself uh, during uh, that period where we redeveloped the Spit uh, Marina uh, to create some larger berths and, and uh, berth some super yachts in, into there. Now Clemens is uh, heading up and, and managing the, the super yacht marina in Sydney itself. So uh, obviously deals with uh, the, the super yachts on a daily basis, their crews, their captains, and then and trying to meet their expectations. Dave Good uh, has uh, started in the... Uh, marine industry up in Cairns, uh, lucky enough to work with David as well, uh, up there and uh, ended up running the, the port operations which included uh, the, the, the super yacht element there and then is the, the heaviest visited marina in Australia as far as where uh, the boats go to, to then cruise out the destinations. Uh, so David was involved in Cairns for a number of years and then last year took up the role with uh, Asmex and Super Yacht Australia as a CEO and uh, has been very active in that space. And I've got to say, uh, from what I've seen, doing a great job uh, getting out there, being visual and, and uh, making some, some great uh, differences in, in the industry. And Rob Cruz, uh, hailing from the US and uh, uh, got into Australia uh, within the industry up in Port Douglas when that was purchased uh, with his partner. Uh, Andrew, who, is Andrew uh, down at the moment? No. At the, no. And uh, they uh, went through uh, some redevelopment, including super yacht berths up in Port Douglas, and then through into the purchase of Crystal Brook, who, who took over and have got more uh, visions to, to continue to increase the uh, uh, capacity of the facility up there. So uh, a, a good spectrum uh, of people to, to speak on on the topics uh, of op really opportunity is the key thing of uh, what we're talking about and how if you're already involved in the industry and ha uh, have capacity and work with the super yachts, it's how to do that more and, and realise some more opportunity. But also for marinas that uh, have no had nothing to do with super yachts in the past is there's real opportunity for you to be a part of helping out F facilitate berthing or, or services whilst we have these little peak spots of, of major events but also if the, with the legislation changes could drive uh, a whole heap of refit and berthing requirements going into the future which will be uh, quite exciting to see. So just to paint the picture basically and say what is a super yacht? Well over in the US they normally classify it around 30 metres plus. In Australia, we um, refer to it more around a 25 metre luxury vessel uh, with 12 or less packs is, is a general classification of a, of a super yacht. Uh, they, it does vary. We've got a, a number of vessels uh, domestically in Australia which sit within that spectrum of, of a super yacht, 25 and over. Um, and they, uh, how a lot of them are in Sydney on a, uh, a fixed sort of berthing uh, arrangement, uh, travel around, go up to Whit Sundays. Uh, there's a number up there as well, and, and, a, and a couple in Cairns. Uh, but there's also the, then your international vessels, 
and the international vessels, just from a value perspective of what they're typically worth, uh, there's the old rule of about a million dollars a metre. Uh, of course, that's just a, a ballpark sort of figure and there'll be uh, a lot of variation in that. But the, the value is, is quite significant. And where that value comes in is definitely with re when we go to refit. Because when you refit or doing maintenance on it, it's, it's a multiple or a division of that value is uh, what's going to be spent on the vessel to maintain. So that, that's a significant thing when we think about skilled labour and jobs and opportunities. So with some uh, data, thanks to, to David, uh, th these are the international numbers we're looking at here, not domestic. So uh, in the last year, uh, we've the, the average size of an of a international touring super yacht was 45.5 metres. And that's a pretty important figure just to look at there when we start to think about, OK, if we're going to plan some infrastructure uh, at a marina, because if, if that's our average, that's a good little um, snapshot of that. Obviously, there's, there's bigger ones and smaller ones. Largest, 126 metres. Now, that, quite often, once you get up to that size, there's, there's not a lot of facilities around that can house a... Uh, a vessel of that size. That's basically a, a ship, uh, a mini cruiser, and uh, and typically will pull up alongside uh, fixed wharf structures that uh, normally berth those sort of arrangements. Uh, Octopussy is uh, one of those. Would that be? That's Octopussy. There you go. Uh, so that's uh, as big as we've had here in the last year or so. They're, they're quite a few are getting that size or bigger, further into. Uh, the med and uh, people just want to just keep on growing the size of these vessels. Uh, the total of international vessels, 74 came into Australia. Uh, and the average length of stay was 41 days. Uh, was that in Australian waters or in a berth, Dave? Uh, either at berth or at a refit facility. Okay, and then they would have stayed within yeah, the region? I wasn't counting cruising days. That's, that's days that it's paying to stay alongside. Okay, paying to stay alongside. So, uh, but quite often uh, when these vessels come down to this region, and I say region, it's Australia and New Zealand and, and north of uh, Australia and New Zealand, they don't just come down for, for six months. They more often will be down in this area for, for about two years, cruise, go to New Zealand, come over to Australia. In that two-year period, do a refit. Now, that could be a major refit that they've priced up and, uh, and through competitive pricing decided to get that refit over in New Zealand or Australia in one of the, the boat yards and we'll be lucky enough to see a couple of those down Coomera tomorrow. Uh, or it'll be a, a, a minor sort of refit um, depending on where the, their planning and project uh, timelines are with the particular vessels. So for the two, in a two year period they will get work done is basically where I'm going with that. Uh, they, they'll get some level of work done on the vessel from and I say minor, they're still going to spend probably a few hundred thousand dollars to major into the millions uh, on a major refit. Uh, so when they make that decision to come down, it's, it's not just out of win. There, there's a lot of planning that goes in. The lead time for them to come to Australia is significant. So a lot of the work that, that David and uh, the individual marinas from, from River Gates to Gold Coast City, uh, boat works, um, Probably missed a couple there, but uh, the those guys that go over to Monaco, Fort Lauderdale, all the time, they're they're doing work that's going to pay off three years, four years, five years down the track. It's not the next year, so it's an investment that they're they're putting in for long term, um, hopefully gains. So uh, that that's a, there's a lot of investment there, and uh, and, a, and great representation for Australia, uh, which promotes jobs uh, and, and a lot of financial gain to uh, both the state and federal governments. Done, uh, back in 2016 uh, by the, the Super Yacht uh, Australia Group and it shows the uh, at that particular time the total tourism value was $190 million and the uh, you can see the split up there from maintenance 575 Operating expense, 400 million. Only 600 in uh, direct uh, contribution from the to, to, the, to the GDP. Uh, 14 
8,500 uh, jobs, 1.2 billion in uh, wages, and the total fleet value in Australia at the time, 7.5 billion. So there, there's some pretty big numbers there in that, just that segment of the industry. This graph here, and this will, this will lead on to, um, uh, and I'll hand over to David in a minute to, to give us an update on this next piece, is the Coastal Training Act has been up for amendments to uh, facilitate more international vessels coming into Australia. And the bottom line is if nothing happens, basically, uh, that's the, the projected uh, value of the, of the industry going out to 2021. And the upper line is if we have these changes in the legislation, uh, then that's, uh, oh, I don't need that anymore. Uh, that's the projected uh, line. So you can see there's, there's quite a significant increase in value from 2.2 to $3.3 billion in value on just this piece of legislation. And, and that value also drives a significant amount of skilled labour. And that, that's the piece there that uh, hopefully government, when David's talking with government, really listen to because it's, it's not just unskilled labour and, and uh, uh, baseline sort of jobs. It was to uh, one of the presentations yesterday. It's that, that middle group of, uh, of the demographics uh, that um, really drives that skilled labour in. So the, the main items that uh, we've been talking about or the op where the opportunities will come from uh, it, we've got the Tokyo Olympic Games in July 2020. So that is, uh, is going to be a, an event which will attract a lot of these vessels. Is there, um, David, do you know if there's any numbers or um, of the group? Uh, we, we had a presentation from uh, someone from Japan, Nigel Beatty. They're, um, they're building a couple of uh, super yacht marinas um, around Yokohama Way. Uh, the, the numbers are a bit loose at the moment because uh, no one's quite booked, but they're expecting in excess of 60 vessels. Yeah, which is a fairly significant sort of number coming in. Uh, America's Cup, uh, I know there's a lot of work going on over there at the moment, but uh, if you want to clarify that. Uh, they're, they're catering for 92 vessels, but they've had inquiries from 120. So that's, yeah. that's, that's a massive... When you look at uh, how many vessels visited Australia for the whole year, last year, for one single event, there's almost double the amount of vessels going to Auckland. Yeah. So just that these uh, these events in themselves, so they're going to have these peak numbers of vessels come into the region. And if they come to New Zealand, as I was saying before, they're not just, most of them won't just come in, do the uh, the World Cup and then, then bugger off. They're going to stay in the region and then come over to Australia and have a look here, plan works, plan some refits and... Uh, uh, just in those those peak little uh, events, and then we've got the the, um, the amendments to the Coastal Training Act, which uh, at this point I'll um, I'll hand over to David to really give you some background on what the, the impediments been, and and also what uh, what's in ahead or what's on the table for uh, the federal government to pass to hopefully free this stuff up, and then uh, what those opportunities or the the real benefits are going to be if those uh, amendments are uh, changed. So, David, do you want to give us sure. a little um, I think I've got an hour and 15 minutes and I can <laughs> <laughs> I can probably fill that talking about what's going on with, uh, with charter. Um, so, in really simple terms, uh, the amount of vessels in the world, uh, super yacht vessels that are available for charter is, is roughly more than half. So, at the moment, uh, those vessels can't come to Australia and operate commercially unless the vessel is imported to Australia. Um, that, that, that's not a system that they're used to doing, so they're not interested. So basically, we're turning away um, at least half the world's fleet. If they do come to Australia, the charter brokers have to black them out um, as not available. Um, they're not, because they're currently coming under a control permit system that doesn't allow them to advertise for charter and doesn't allow them to advertise for sale. So it's it's... Yeah, it's not an attractive place to bring your vessel. So at the moment, the, the vessels that are coming, the, the 74 vessels that are coming, are here because of the owner's wishes or um, a, a large portion of them are coming for refit. Um, 
particularly with the Australian dollar the way it is and the standard of our trades here in the facilities are you know, as good as anywhere else in the world and you'll see that when you do your, your tour. Um, so that's been the driver for the vessels coming. Everywhere I've been, um, the first question overseas I get asked is, have you got charter yet? Do you allow charter yet? It is the largest impediment to our industry. We, we've been pushing, um, in my previous role, I was uh, on the, uh, the Super Yacht Group Great Barrier Reef um, board and I was the, the person pushing charter um, for that group. And uh, for the last nine years, we've been trying to work with government to get uh, a solution to charter. Uh, we were originally pushed down the track of using a temporary permit under the um, Coastal Training Act. We tried to do that with a vessel called Hemisphere, which is a 45 metre sailing catamaran. And they were quite happy to be the guinea pig. Uh, unfortunately, we, we couldn't get there because there's a couple of requirements under the Coastal Training Act for a temporary permit that was not um, achievable. One of those is that they would not allow a, um, a voyage to be in and out of the same port. Now, you can't tell someone who's chartering a vessel for you know, half a million dollars for a week that he has to go to another port that he doesn't want to go to just to tick the box. Uh, the other thing was that there was a requirement that you had to have five pre-booked voyages before the vessel was given a permit. So it's a real chicken and the egg. And most of these vessels, if they're here for a season, so they're here for six months, they're stoked if they get three charters, they're happy if they get two, and they're comfortable if they've had one. Uh, they're, they're not looking to be all that active, which is good news for marina operators, because they're going to sit alongside for the majority of that six months um, and, and, and pay you. <laughs> so so that it wasn't achievable under the current cost, uh, Coastal Training Act. So in 2015, changes to the Coastal Training Act were put through the lower house. They were put to the Senate. Um, we spent a significant amount of time up in Queensland with Senator Lazarus, um, taking him around the, the reef fit yards, and uh, we, we thought he understood it. Um, there was some moves down in uh, Tasmania with Jackie Lambie, and those two changed their vote at the last minute, and we got defeated by two votes in the Senate. The, the government said, don't worry, we're about to go to a double dissolution and our numbers will be better. Well, it, it was worse, <laughs> a lot worse. Uh, so then we had to, in, in the previous government, we had to convince eight of the ten crossbenchers to vote with us to be able to get it through. So we did a significant amount of work uh, with those crossbench senators. We had nine of them agree, um, a few of them quite publicly, uh, including One Nation. And uh, they, the government was encouraged by that, put the new laws through in August last year through the lower house, and then they decided to change Prime Minister the week after when it was due to go through the Senate. The legislation has since sat there along with a, a large, long list of other legislations that have not proceeded anywhere past the lower house. Um, I was quite surprised the other Saturday night <laughs> um, when they've been voted back in. We had been doing a, a fair bit of work with, um, with Albanese on the other side, should Labor win. If Labor had won, we had a, a solution that would have taken at least another 12 months. Back to the drawing boards of redrafting, going out for public consultation, um, redrafting and then submitting through the passages of Parliament. So uh, where we are now is that we've got legislation that suits us, that has been passed by the lower house in August and with the new composition of the Senate, there's now only six crossbenchers and five of them will automatically side with government. Jackie Lambie's the only, um, the only one that we, we know she won't vote for it. She didn't vote for it last time, but we don't need her vote. They only need three of those crossbenchers to vote for them. So we have now got a, uh, a policy that could be passed very, very quickly. So the Senate composition doesn't change until the 1st of July. Um, so post 1st of July, uh, we'll be putting on a lot of pressure with government to say, we need to be one of the first ones uh, passed through. And the reason being is that we need to start selling that Australia is open for charter in time for vessels to plan what they're doing around the Tokyo Olympics. 
So the Tokyo Olympics is, is our biggest trigger to get government into action and, and to say, look, we've nine years now, we've been sitting back waiting for this. It's now quite urgent because the missed opportunity, if we're not open to those 50% of the, the fleet, um, will be significant. So the Tokyo Olympics happening next year, we will need to start um, telling the, the world's fleet uh, as soon as possible so they can plan particularly what they're doing between the Olympics and the America's Cup. We think that there's... Th we'd be lucky to see a vessel leave the Pacific between those events. They're going to be looking for places to spend at least that six months and post America's Cup. If we don't keep them here in the Pacific and, and show them what's available, it will be the biggest missed opportunity that we've seen. Um, we will have more vessels in the Pacific during the next two years than we have ever seen in our lifetime and uh, it's a real opportunity. The, the, the yards, which really is our um, attractor, you know, it is the diamond in the South Pacific. The, the, the yards um, that are here in South East Queensland are as good if not better um, along with the trades than anywhere else in the world. So we don't want those vessels um, heading back to the Med and heading back to the Caribbean without experiencing our refit yards. And the one thing that we, we think we are lacking is berth space. We need super yacht specific berth space at the marinas. Um, and I, I think we can go into it a little bit more uh, later, but uh, if you've got a marina that the crew will want to stay at, um, get prepared to put in some big berths and earn some decent money from those berths because the boats will be here. Yeah, thanks, Dave. Uh, so it's fair to say this Coastal Trading Act, uh, when it originated, what year did it uh, get drawn up, the original act? Uh, it's a 2011 piece of legislation. Well, so it's not that it old. Was, it was drafted by Albanese. <laughs> um, so both sides of politics agree that charter should happen. They disagree with how it should happen. Uh, Albanese is very protective of the legislation that, that he has drawn up, um, which is the current Coastal Trading Act. So he was suggesting uh, standalone legislation that would have given us and cruise ships and separated us from the Coastal Trading Act. But that's now not going to happen. So obviously when it was drawn up, there wasn't a lot of thought, I'm assuming, uh, put to that to using super yachts or, or considering super yachts in that act when you think of they couldn't return to the same port, for example, just that one statement mm -hmm. there uh, obviously is a big one, which for me just means that they, they weren't really thinking about super yachts at all when they drew up that. The, the Coastal Trading Act really doesn't have anything to do with super yachts at all. It's cabotage. It's, um, it's, it's drawn up for um, coastal trade. So it's it, it, it purely the because we fit under that and we're operating commercially, um, that we need a, a way to, to be um, withdrawn from those um, cabotage uh, protections. Uh, and with this um, significant increase in, in traffic into the region and if the Coastal Trading Act gets changed, that, that, the, that's a piece that will be long-term benefit to the, to the industry and in, in, in Australia, or actually the whole region really. Uh, that, that piece there, but how many jobs do you think would would be generated if uh, during these events and, and the act uh, in the, over the next few years? Yeah, it's worth eleven thousand jobs. That's uh, a fairly significant number. Uh, so, uh, yeah, good luck, and uh, <laughs> I think you, you'll have the support of most in the industry, uh, long range, to uh, to to drive that over the line with the um, relevant senators and. Um, just uh, good luck with Jackie as well. I'm sure she'll be uh, quite easy to, to persuade. <laughs> uh, l luckily, we, we don't have to worry about her now. Um, you know, it was a lot of work trying to get eight crossbenchers in the previous government with how, you know, the, the real minor micro parties that they were from. Um, it was a lot of heavy slog to get them to convince it. We even had one... Um, a chief of staff of a certain senator who's no longer there, thank goodness, who required us to get him a free berth for his 110 sloop 
110 foot sloop that he wants to live on in the eastern suburbs of Sydney. So, and, and some people here probably know who that would be. But uh, yeah, it was, it was challenging. Nice. Uh, just moving on to uh, probably a, a bit of a holistic sort of question, uh, bringing it back, and that is, and I'll, and I'll throw to you, Mark, uh, what, what is the main attraction for these vessels to come to this region, to Australia? What, what do they see? What do they want to come here for? Yeah, thanks, Brett. Um, well, at the moment, I think uh, the way the world's uh, shaping up, uh, it's a very safe destination. It's a developed nation. Uh, notwithstanding... Uh, what David's gone on about with uh, basically having to import a boat and there's a lot of cost in post, GST difficulties. Um, that reminds me of having to take a boat into Brazil, having a, a local there sign that he owned the boat and we had to pay a million do US dollar bond. So that whole thing reminds me of a third world application if you're a, a foreign owner trying to bring your yacht here. So that's where that really is going to make a big difference. But yeah, it's a safe, clean, developed nation. Um, obviously, we've got great natural wonders such as the Barrier Reef, um, the beauty of Tasmania, that, uh, the West Coast, you know, the Northern Territory. Uh, the list goes on and on. And they're all very different, very diverse, and all have their own thing. It's clean. There's so much uh, pollution around the world. We're actually a very clean place to live. We're well organised, sometimes over organised. And that's that's a, that's a, can be an issue in its, itself. Um, we've got world class support services that uh, have already been alluded to. Uh, we've got uh, a lot of increased haul out capacity coming in line up in Cairns and places like that. So that's going to be a bit of uh, an increase. I know that uh, some of the uh, other uh, marina establishments here in southeast Queensland are looking to increase their capacity of what they can haul out. And and what they can service. And a lot of boaters, boats do get a lot of service work while they're in the water. They don't necessarily need to get hauled out all the time. Um, well, so sorry, just to interject there, the, so what capacity uh, are we going up to in, in, these, uh, in these different regions? Cairns, you mentioned, but also I believe in a lot of Brisbane River or um, on Cooma, there's a big increase in, in the size or lifting capacity. Uh, what size is that? And what for, from a, a tonnage perspective, but what length of vessel does that translate to? Yeah, well, I believe uh, Cairns is getting 1,100 tonne uh, travel lift. Um, so uh, one of the last yachts that I ran overseas was a 50 metre delta called Happy Days. And uh, I think it weighed in American terms 550 long tonnes. So we had a 600 tonne travel lift and we used to do our best to blow the tyres out on that thing at the back. But uh, so that was a 50 metre vessel. So, what, you know, you're probably getting up to, uh, you know, 60 to 70 metre vessels with that 1,100 tonne lift. Okay, thanks. And I, b I believe the yard as well is uh, Ben. Are you in the room, Ben Schooley? Uh, right, 1,300 tonne. And is anyone going to top that with 1,350? It's a, it's almost an auction here. <laughs> yeah, Dave. Yeah, look, I, I think Rivergate's also talking about a synchro to go to two and a half. Oh. So two and a half. Uh, geez, what? <laughs> at two and a half, you're basically lifting a, yeah, a ship. Or how much does uh, Octopussy weigh? Uh, she's about. Yeah, she's. You wouldn't pull her out. She's okay. too heavy. Yeah. <laughs> Um, just one thing, I mean, the, the, the growth has been exponential overseas. When I first went to Fort Lauderdale, there was, you'd go to the shipyard, there was all these boats that were around 90 foot long, and they were all getting 10 foot stern extensions so they could reach the 100 foot mark. Now you look in the glossy magazines, there are 100 metre boats coming online left, right and centre. Uh, 50 to 60 metre boats is, is pretty much the norm over there, really 50 to 70 metres is what is the, uh, the mark that most of these people are going for and, and a few can get even beyond that. Mm. Uh, so things are, are just getting larger and larger there. Uh, so when, the, when a skipper's planning, especially when you look at some of these bigger vessels, uh, which have to come out on their own bum, basically, uh, some of the smaller stuff can come out on the, um, on the back of the, the old, what they call the ute, Dock, uh, dock, um, dock wise, um, but the bigger ones obviously have to come on their own bum, and 
how far out do skippers normally plan those sort of journeys and uh, and how, what's the process there? What, what, is it getting in the ear? Is it driven heavily by uh, the captain or, or is it the owner or is it sometimes a bit of both? Yeah, it's a combination of everything. And, and uh, one thing with yachting compared to, say, shipping, um, you know, with, with shipping you kind of know, okay, you know, that shipping line works in a particular way. With yachting, everyone is an individual owner and another captain. So there's lots of personalities and different ways of doing things. So it's, a, it's not a blanket formula as such. Uh, some some uh, owners have got interests in sport fishing. Some would never put a fish on their boat. They just want to go to the best restaurant and be seen. So there's quite a diverse thing. But typically if it was a med-based boat, they're probably going to be looking at doing something like this with a, a lead time, I'd say, around two years. If they're in Asia, it could be as soon as their next season that is appropriate. Okay. And uh, with that, and we, we sort of touched on a little bit, is... The, the current refit capacity in Australia, uh, and this is a probably a, a question for both you, Mark, and, and David, uh, are we, w can we handle that, uh, that growth now or do we really need more refit uh, capacity? And we'll, we'll get into the marina berths. Uh, as we touched, we, we know there's a bit of deficiency there to take hold of the, the growth. But um, with the refit yards, what's your, your take on that? Well, yeah, I think so. I mean, with uh, the things that are going on on Cairns and here on the Gold Coast, there's a lot of expansion that uh, we're going to be pretty well placed. We mightn't be able to do everybody over a very short period of time, but uh, on the longer term basis, I think it's, it's shaping up pretty well. What do you think? Yeah, look, I, I think we're fine with refit. In fact, my concern is I need to get the charter rules through to keep the yards busy. You know, the yards are all planning um, well in advance and, you know, it's a bit of an arms race about who can do what. That's good for the industry and um, we just need to get the overseas boats. Those yards that are doing that work can't live based on the domestic boats that are here now. They have to get those international boats. So the refit yards, I think, are easily going to cope and they've all got expansion plans ready to, to press the button. Um, it's the wet berths, it's, it's where we're going to park them um, when they come for, for you know, six to 12 months on a, a temporary licence to charter. That probably leads me on to my next question, which is where, I, I mean, the, the graph I had up earlier sort of like showed Queensland as a significant, uh, the most significant state for visitation. Uh, where regionally or, or down to uh, a city do you see most of them migrating? Where's the the opportunities that really haven't been tapped into yet, uh, that that's sitting there waiting uh, because when they're over here they want to look at probably more than just the, the Great Barrier Reef, there, there's other opportunities there. Yeah, look, um, the traditional locations where the vessels have been going for a while, uh, their length of stay is quite short. So I know up in Cairns it's around 20 to 25 days length of stay. Um, down here uh, the length of stay is a lot longer. So since Southport Yacht Club have started really chasing the boats, the boats seem to be staying for a lot longer because the season is you know, pretty much year-round here. Um, with charter, we expect the vessels to stay for a lot longer. You know, in excess of 100 days easily should be the average and most of those vessels should be here for at least six months and they will travel further and they'll be looking for new destinations. So... Places that um, don't see a lot of those vessels expect to see those vessels as more of them come here and they stay longer and they start looking um, where they can go and what, uh, what itineraries they can put together. Tasmania, I think, is going to be a hot spot, but only during you know, a few, <laughs> few weeks, if not a month or two of the year. Um, so if you've got a year-round destination like we do in this location, um, vessels could easily stay a whole year. Okay, and probably just uh, moving on and bringing uh, Clemens into the discussion. Uh, for yourself, where have you seen uh, uh, growth already uh, or what uh, impediments have you got at the moment, the capacity issues, for example, that's holding back Sydney Harbour? Uh, thanks, Brett. I think uh, for Sydney Harbour, it's mostly real estate. We just haven't got enough marina berth in Sydney Harbour. Um, Super Yacht Marina has seen a number of berth bookings already for 2020-21. Um, we've taken our four bookings. 
which means you know captains are planning well in advance. International bookings take take a year to mature, um, and that's after you've established that first network contact. Uh, the domestic market, the, the Australian super yachts, they book later in the year. We generally see probably um, at 12 months out from that where the inquiry comes through. Um, six months to the event, that's what we already call last minute. The opportunities in Sydney are um, very limited. Uh, I think there are still there is still scope for additional boats in Sydney Harbour as we work together. Um, we've seen a number of boats coming into the harbour in December, January last year, drop anchor in Rose Bay, um, sit there nicely for, for six, five, six days uh, before they leave again, which is great. The boats are coming in, but we're not maximising the opportunities there. And I think that's where the, uh, where the Sydney operators can work together, where we can make a difference. Um, I'd like to say we need to work a lot more um, as a region, uh, and that includes New Zealand, that includes uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, at the conference that they've organised uh, earlier in the week, we've seen some really good opportunities coming out of Japan. Uh, they've already uh, alluded to that. And I think if we put Japan, Southeast Asia, Australia and New Zealand in the mix, we definitely have a fantastic itinerary to attract and keep boats for, for two years here. Coming back to Brett's question, where are we going to park them? Um, we need to work on it. Uh, the heading of the topic, you know, are you ready for it, does prompt some urgency. Um, it's not too late yet, but we really need to see, can we lobby with government? Can we find alternative spaces to, to take the boats that only want to be here for maybe two weeks? 10 days. Um, as I said, real estate in Sydney Harbour is, is, is premium. We haven't got enough. Uh, we, we make the best of it, but we are, we are missing out on a lot of opportunities in Sydney. Okay. And Rob, uh, with yourself, when you started up at Port Douglas there, and I remember actually speaking with you in the early days uh, when you were thinking about it, is it the, the classic, uh, let's just roll the dice, we'll build it and they'll come? A bit of that, and then have, did they come? Uh, they did come. We built that business around, in, in its current form, around a really strong on-land offering. Um, so we have a brewery at our marina, and there's a cocktail bar, as well as the Super Yacht Burst, and also the larger bursts that were off the back of that development, so not necessarily you know, 40, 50 meter bursts, but 22 and 24 meter bursts. And so there's an opportunity, obviously, for the, for the larger vessels. We are primarily a domestic marina in terms of super yachts. We probably 80% of our visitation is domestic cruising vessels. And then 20% we see um, sort of last minute bookings, really. They find out that Port Douglas has a marina and they can fit into it and they come and visit us. Um, but we added, 16 22 meter bursts and six of those are cat and they just there was latent demand and we, we we felt like it was there and it came to fruition really quickly they basically are full year-round and that that made the project viable so one way to look at this is yes you can add the big bursts but in your development plan and when you're looking at all your options that look at what else you can add while you're adding bursts and that's probably, we, uh, we'll discuss that a bit further down the track is it's all well and good to, to put in a, a nice 50 metre dock, for example, but if the vessel's only going to be there for three, four months, what, how do you get a return out of that uh, dock in the, in the off-season effectively and what design principles and things, or operational uh, things can we consider to um, maximise or get a return on your investment? So we'll um, cover that off a little bit further. But um, something you touched on there with the microbrewery and probably back to you, Mark, is what, what are the key drivers of where you're over here, the, the owner or, or charter, as what David alluded to, only occurs for s small pieces of time. Uh, so then it's uh, up to the, the, the captain, I'm assuming, to say, where are we going to dock the bo boat to, to home port it, for a better word? during those, uh, those times when you're, you're not cruising, what are the key decisions and drivers, uh, putting refit aside, uh, that where do you put your boat? Yeah, there's a couple of aspects to that. One is if the owner's on board, where he wants to go, obviously. 
and, uh, and quite often when the owner's not there, it may well be up to the captain of where the boat then goes. Now, whether that's uh, uh, to a different marina that may have better rates than a particular spot, um, or, you know, most of you know Rybovich in West Palm Beach, um, which is a, a, a working marina there, but it's actually like a resort that happens to be a shipyard. And most of the captains and crew love to stay at that place because it's, it's just fantastic. They've got a crew club, swimming pools. Uh, it's, it's quite incredible. It's like a resort stay, but it happens to be a shipyard, you know. Um, but from the, probably from the point of view of, like, infrastructure, I suppose, as well, uh, one of the biggest things on my list is uh, uh, trying to find a, a marina that does have reliable shore power. If you've got reliable shore power, that's a big thing. Um, not so much that people rave about it, but if you have bad, you know, if your shore power is not reliable, word gets out pretty quickly. And next minute, you've got boats with generators running everywhere. And especially if the owner's on board, then you might be getting some fumes or smells. Or, and the crew hate washing the boat, even though they do it all the time, you know, having to go out and do the water line every day, things like that. Um, obviously, security is a big issue whether the owner is on or off the vessel when you're in a place uh, that is much more of a downtown situation such as here or Sydney or, or Cairns. I think security is uh, quite a big one. Um, and then you've got uh, other items that are pretty important, I feel, especially if you're trying to keep a vessel there for a little while. Um, blackwater pump out, that's uh, pretty critical. Um, to the dock? To the dock, yeah. So... Um, uh, if you've got the owner on board for an extended stay and all of a sudden you've got to move the boat just to go and do a pump out somewhere and then move it back and if it's a 70 metre boat, it's not that it can't be done but it's a day. It's nearly a day to do that. Um, and there's other things that people want to get done. You know, they're not there just to hang around for the black water pump out. And, uh, and places like I said that uh, Rybovich Marina which is a pretty special place but uh, they actually have... Uh, dock fueling at every berth, um, which I'm not saying that you would do that at every berth here, but if you've got a tea head that is just one tea head that you're going to be doing, you know, really focusing on this super yacht market, um, then you can have, have fueling out there. You don't have to have the bowsers on the dock, you just bring the cart out, it goes through a metre, then you pack the cart away, it still looks clean, and obviously you can use that for other commercial vessels as well. Okay, thanks. And uh, probably moving through the group, Clemens, yourself, uh, what, what key uh, drivers with your discussions with uh, uh, captains and crew uh, do you find that, um, uh, what, what are the key things to do to attract uh, boats to your marina? Uh, just, just one more point too. Uh, for the boats, when they're sp the larger they get, the more they need access to a golf buggy that they can drive out to the vessels. Once again, especially if it's a long way out on a tee head, just the provisioning alone is actually a really big deal. I was wondering where you were going there with the golf buggy and, and teeing, teeing off at the, at the end of the, the docks. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing, Mark. Logistics for super yachts, there's so much that needs to go on and come off. Um, the closer you've gotten to the foreshore, the, the better it is, the easier it is. And that work starts really early in the morning, 6.30, 7 o'clock in peak summer. They want to do as much as possible early in the mornings. And at the super yacht marina, I've seen it. Uh, the coals delivery comes in with 40 crates and that just services the crew on board for a couple of days and um, uh, trying to to move that, that that fresh food stuff all the way out to a tea head becomes arduous so the closer it is the better it is um, other things we've seen is, is refueling we we manage that by truck so the shorter the line the better it is um, servicing life rafts uh, a lot of the life rafts are at places on the on the vessel that you can't just manhandle which means you need to uh, get a 60-ton crane purely to get the reach from the dock to the uh, to the top of the vessel. Um, captains feel it's an advantage if that can be done whilst the, the boat's at the marina, rather than moving to a services dock or to a yard. And the yard's got a very important place to it, but a lot of in, uh, in berth maintenance can easily be done at the marina, but it requires logistical support from the marina. Trucks coming in, um, pellets being delivered. How can you manage that if the marina berth for a superyacht is much further out, which is generally the case on a, on a more traditional marina? So logistical uh, support, that's what I see as an important one. Yeah, David, are you got anything further to add? Yeah, look, uh, keeping the crew happy is, is key. Um, you know, 
when you've got a brewery and restaurants that the crew can hang out at, um, which is an opportunity for, for you um, to make a return on some of your food and beverage offerings at your marina. Um, you'll find that when there is a large vessel in, you know, um, some of these really large ones have got in excess of 40 crew. And um, they're all getting paid very well and they all like to spend most of the money. <laughs> so you, you'll find that you've suddenly got some very wealthy people that are spending a fortune at your food and beverage offerings um, when you've got a, a vessel there. So um, if you keep the crew happy, and the places that we see the longest dwell um, for a vessel are the places where the crew are happy. The captain doesn't want a high turnover on his staff. Um, the owner likes to see the same faces every time he visits the vessel. So um, it's amazing how influential the crew are on where the vessel gets to stay. So if you keep the crew happy and they've got a good offering and a normal lifestyle, you know, being able to get off the boat and go for a run or a cycle or uh, in the case of here, they get to go across the road and they can go for a surf and a swim. They can go down to the cafes and they have what would be a normal lifestyle, particularly the very large boats that pretty much have to anchor off in most locations. Um, you're onto a winner and they'll stay and keep coming back. So your upland facilities is definitely a, an important factor there. And the one thing you alluded to was anchoring off, which probably into the discussion piece is, especially in these peaks of uh, the events where we're going to have uh, a large number come in, it's not viable for a lot of marinas to go out and build a 50, two, three, four, 50 metre docks that are going to be used for the next two years and then the numbers might come off. So it's, it's thinking of, okay, if a vessel anchors off close by, what can I do to facilitate that shore to ship uh, transfer of, of staff and crew and, and what to do in those areas? Rob, uh, yourself, um, adding to that, uh, the Not lessons you've learned? Not much really to add. You guys yeah. covered it pretty well. Um, we locally have worked with local. We have, Port Dog is a small town. Everything's walkable, bikeable. And we've worked with, um, so instead of having a gym, which we thought about, um, we worked with our local gym, which is a five-minute walk up the road, and we either give them a discount or we have a, a punch card that we purchase from them and give it to the crew. The same with Hemingway's, the brewery. We all give them the local's discount card, and Hemingway's is happy to support that. The town really has you know, gathered around this idea that these domestic yachts that are coming in are, are, are they're smaller, they're 35 and 40 meter yachts, they're coming with anywhere between five and eight, maybe 10 crew. That, that's a, keeping them happy. It's not just us, the marina, it's like all of our local businesses are recognizing that people providing flowers, the, the bakeries providing baked goods, that sort of thing, they all recognize that it's important. Yeah, and with the, uh, the works, because you're, you're fairly recent sort of development there yourself, uh, one of the more recent uh, putting, super yacht berths in in Australia, uh, the things that worked for you, the things that you go, uh, it's like building a house, you, you think you've got the plan all right and you, you, once you move in you go, oh, that wall probably should have been uh, two foot back or something like that. What are, what are the lessons learned that you, you think would, you could have done better the um, next time? A bit of a story with us, we started, the catalyst for the super yacht berths was a dredging program. So we purchased that marina in 2013 it had about 45% of our basin was unused and undredged for 30 years. So there were islands out there. Um, this dredging program came through. We had just purchased it, was in a couple of months. Um, and we then had to find another million dollars to spend on dredging. So at post completion of that, we stood at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the old docks and stared out at the, at the at blank water going, all right, now we have to make money out of this. So we added, we went through the design process with IMC with a number of different uh, designs that can, that will meet the requirement coming in the leads. We've got about three meters of water, three and a half meters of water coming in. So there's a restriction really there. So we designed first to 40, 45 meters and then descended to 26. And that's all on the outside row. Um, and then the internal row, as I alluded to earlier, was 22 meter bursts, and that was a really big win. Um, power was the probably the most costly sort of unknown piece, and it's difficult. You know, the builders can do the best they can, 
um, with existing infrastructure and running new new power requirement over existing infrastructure can be tricky. Um, so the thing that I guess I would, would that really nailing down the power requirement, we did, but there's always going to be costs related to unexpected pieces of infrastructure that may or may not be able to hold what you're trying to put on them and retrofitting and that sort of thing. So that's probably it. You know, everything else, there's going to be cost consultancy fees and geotech and all of that, but you can really foresee that. Yeah, you know, just uh, when uh, Bill Clemens was involved too with the spit redevelopment and we had to upsize the power there, the, the cost on the power alone was uh, just under a million dollars. Uh, to, to upgrade, it was a that significant number. Uh, that was us. I think it was uh, six or eight hundred thousand dollars to on the marina side. That was the quoted piece, and then to deliver to upgrade our DB on land and deliver power to the agreed upon point, it was another hundred and twenty five grand. Yeah, so, so it's, it's it's real. So and not only with the, the super yachts, I mean the electrification discussion that's been taking place as well. If you combine the two together. Power is a big thing. You'll find uh, if you haven't assessed your power input to the site yet, uh, it, it's definitely something you should be doing at your facilities in the future, in the near future. Just o oversize it. Yeah. Because we have, we oversized it, and now we can kind of choose if we have a vessel that wants to come in permanently and they require 125 amp and a 64. You know, we can have that discussion with the customer and say, look, that's an $8,000 investment for us to upgrade this pedestal. And we ha we can have that discussion with them because we have the surplus power. If we didn't have the surplus power, there's no conversation to have. So actually I'll um, ask Mark, what the hell are these things chewing? I mean, 125 amps, 240 amps, some of these things. What, what's going on on these boats? Yeah, well, uh, once again, it just depends how big they are. They're, you're not going to be able to cater to maybe some of the biggest boats, and I wouldn't say that you need to maybe cater to every 80 metre boat or 100 metre boat around the world, but you definitely need to be getting into that 50, 60 metre range. Um, I'm trying to remember with happy days what we used to use, I think it was uh, 408 volts or, you know, the American voltage, I can't remember, it's all, all a bit weird, but it was uh, a couple of hundred amps at least, I think, yeah. Yeah, typically when we're getting up, we're going 415 and... Um yeah, 200 amps. Uh, I know it's quite regular. I remember doing cans and and we had uh, vessels turning up there saying, give us two of those and have you got a third? <laughs> it's just uh, the power thing is, is uh, as, as Rob says, is oversize and, and then hope that you got it right there. Uh, David, did you want yeah, to? Look, and I think one of the challenges is that um, when you're chasing the, the big overseas boats, your occupancy is not going to be huge. Um, you know, you shouldn't be shooting for more than 60% occupancy, um, but you should charge a rate that, that gives you a return on, on that. But uh, your, your challenge is to get the extra power from the power companies when you're not using it every day. Um, and, and if you're quite seasonal and you're asking for a, a, a massive amount of power during the season and then nothing at all um, on the off-season... Yeah. So if you have on land um, and look for opportunities to bundle into on land, um, there's there are auction services that go out um, and find you the best price. There's a sign up fee and it's generally reduces a bit over time. That's all on offer. Um, so hunt for the best price. Yeah. And Rob, with uh, with the development that you did, uh, when about did it complete? We opened in August 15. Thing. So there's been a few years for you yeah. to prove up the income effectively and yeah. and with the um, just just focusing on the super yacht burst that you did, uh, generally what's your occupancy through the year? We're about 50 to 60 percent through the wet season yeah. and then we um, struggle with birthing by September. So we're pretty much full. Okay. Um, and it's not always that we're filling our, you know, 40 meter berth with a 40 meter vessel. There may be a 28 or a 32 meter vessel in that, but focusing on yield uh, is important. So right sizing the vessel to the right berth. And so we, we now, we, of course we look at occupancy, but we also look at yield. How are we best using the berths, um, across the marina, including the super yacht berths. And do you feel that, uh, where you're placed now, three odd years later or three or four years later that, uh, it's, you're getting a good uh, return on that investment? Oh, certainly. Um, that, that was, uh, as it turns out, it's funny, there's a lot of stress uh, when we were borrowing a lot 
of money to do this project. But uh, as it turns out, it was a real no-brainer. It just didn't seem like it at the time. Um, ROI is, is, was very achievable um, in the end. And again, the Super Yacht Bursts are super important to that, but also the opportunity that we were able to add larger bursts, not necessarily Super Yacht Bursts. Yeah. And, and you hinted to it uh, before, really, the h how do you uh, look at utilisation of those big bursts, which, I mean, to put in a 50-metre berth, it's, uh, the cost is exponentially higher than a, than a 15-metre berth, for example, or your fingers are a lot wider, the, um, uh, the structure and John LeMann, I see in the crowd you probably uh, know a little bit about design principles, I dare say, on, on super yacht berths compared to a 15 metre. Uh, so the construction cost is a lot higher, power uh, and piling is probably, um, John would you say pilings are one of your bigger ticket items also? Yeah, so uh, to, to everyone uh, on the panel, what are, what are the ways, and starting with you, Rob, to utilise that facility, get to make some, some money out of it when the, the big, big boats aren't there, basically? Let's, well, John helped us a lot in that project. Um, we oversized the large bursts, the uh, 35-metre bursts that are there. The first four are really cat bursts, and that was looking down the road because the tourism industry is going to grow. Um, there's no question about it. The vessel sizes are going to grow also. And so really, um, as sort of a hedge down the road, we've got an offering that the tourism people may use. Um, we have opportunity potentially for reconfiguration in that marina that can house larger yachts as well as the tourist boats, which will be a kind of based on demand at that time. Um, we. In terms of utilization, we have a lot of yachts that come up that may be 26 meters or 28, and they also have a chase boat that's 32 meter or 32 foot. And so we charge for that boat, and they love to have them in their own berth. So we put them in their own berth, and then all of a sudden you have a you know 42 meter boat basically in terms of how you charge for it. Um, we don't. We are judicious about how we charge. We don't. We don't. That we want the customer to feel like they're getting value. And so how we charge for that tender, you know, we do it in a sensible way that they feel it's equitable and, and we feel is equitable. Um, but that's one way. Um, really, that's, that's our, in terms of utilizing those bursts, they sit for, you know, four months of the year in Port Douglas and three of them are empty and I kind of look at it and think, wow, okay. But it always seems to come good in the end. They're full for six or seven months of the year and, that, and that, um, that's sufficient from... Uh, from from my expectation of return, and David, uh, your learnings when you're at Cairns, for example. Yeah, look, we we were probably at the highest end of the the price spectrum, and uh, certainly the overseas boats never never questioned it. They thought it was quite cheap. Um, the domestic boats are price sensitive, so if you are chasing domestic boats, then you know you, you, your returns are nowhere near as high, but they're there regularly. Um, you know, you, you know they're coming every year. Um, if you want to chase the, the big overseas boats, then you've got to be, you know, prepared to charge them uh, a rate to give to you a proper return and expect that those berths might be empty. Um, factor in that the fa you've got to, you know, do your marketing to get those boats in. Um, but they're quite happy to pay because the rates that they're paying overseas um, make our highest rates here in Australia look very small. Uh, Clemens? going to say that the value proposition it's not always about being the lowest priced obviously it's a race to the bottom we definitely focus on the complete value proposition at that marina and then and I'm happy to be at the higher end um, and I want and I ask for feedback if they don't feel like they're getting value I want to know and I want to build the value and it's not building value by uh, lowering a price I agree on that it's um uh, uh, being honest with the captains up front, telling what you can offer, what you can't offer. Uh, you put a proposal out to that that might be negotiated once or twice, but once they come in, generally there's there's not much discussion on the uh, on the rate itself. Um, Superior Marina, we've been we've been lucky enough that we've been able to change the mix from 
uh, residential permanent customers in the 30, 35 meter range. We've picked up a lot more of those. We would like to attract the super yachts, the 70 meters. Um, there is a bit of push from the uh, the owners of the site to, to reconsider that, that, that mix um, because having it vacant for you know, three, four, five, six months of the year and all the marketing that goes into it to attract those customers, maybe we're better off. So it's not always the size of the boat um, that makes it appealing. I must say from experience, the raid, if the boats are there for a longer period, it sure works. Um, but uh, uh, it, it might not be for everybody. And even the Super Yacht Marina is now really, I need to make a case to the owners, look, do we want to have those Super Yachts coming in? Um, and I see positives of that. But the owners want to have that security. And that's the 12 months, 35 meter. And just, uh, um, Clemens, with that, look, in Sydney itself, the domestic market, 25 meters over, uh, has that been something where there's been some good movement and growth? Significant growth, significant growth. Um, we've seen that in that charter market, although that's still very young. There's, there's, there's probably nine, nine charter boats on Sydney Harbour. Yeah, um, but it's the it's the private wealth, it's the it's the individual. There's a lot of Asian wealth coming into Sydney Harbour, and they step onto 35 meter first boat ever, a and they use it, and that's where we see the growth into it. It's, it's always been a bit. Um, where owners feel uncomfortable if the boat gets bigger, but 30, 35 meters is, is quite a normal boat now to get around in Sydney Harbour without attracting attention. <laughs> attracting attention, I think that's a good one. Uh, Mark, yourself? Uh, yeah, I think uh, one of the things, especially for the international yachts where you, know, you say you're, the prices are higher and so forth, that they're typically not that worried about the price the only time you'll get in trouble is if you don't give the service. It's all about service because that's what they're used to. Whether it's dealing with a marina, a shipyard operator, the engine supplier, Caterpillar, MTU, um, it's all about service. And that's uh, one thing that sometimes in Australia I thought lacked a little bit, not maybe from how the job turned out, but the relationship service. But I think that's that's really improved a lot, probably in the last five or so years. Um, and as once again, as a generalisation, you may say you shouldn't generalise, but um, I think with international captains, when and when I was overseas as an international captain, the captains were treated with a greater deal of esteem than they are here. That's just my pickup. I might be wrong on that. That's just what I've felt at times. Yeah, no, I definitely saw that uh, when I was. Uh directly involved in super yachts, the international captains uh, walked and spoke a different way to, to an Aussie uh, captain that had uh, obviously worked their way up quite often in tourism industry or so, or commercial area in, in Australia, then jumped on the, the super yachts. So they're probably just cultural sort of um, differences there. Uh, something we touched on earlier was, so for, for the Marinas like uh, Rob's and, and Clemens have already got some hard infrastructure there, but we've got this bubble that's about to come with uh, an influx of, of vessels. How, um, uh, and starting with you, Mark, how, how do you think the, um, they can capitalise on some quick little wins or infrastructure builds or something out in the water? And that, that comes not only for those guys, but uh, marinas that um, haven't or, or don't deal with super yachts, but these, they, there's going to be enough where there's not going to be enough dock space, but if you can provide some sort of service and, and, and really talk about what service, what could you do if you, if you don't even have a super yacht berth to get someone to park out, as long as you've got the draft and, and anchor location, to attract those guys to your marina and, and be able to uh, keep them there for during this bubble. Um, now, I'm not sure if on a temporary basis if you could put out some big mooring boys and stern head for a short season. You know, if that's a, a viable proposition, I'm not up on the pricing of that, but uh, it's definitely an area that most of those vessels are used to on a day-in, day-out basis is to be stern too. Um, I think the Super Yacht Rendezvous, I mean, that, that was very well done. The way all the, the yachts were stern too, it looked fabulous for their event, and you can really stack them in at that point. Um, possibly for the Brisbane River, you could just have some large mooring buoys where, you know, the vessels have uh, got a fore and aft mooring, you know, with the, uh, the, the you know, basically fla facing up river or down river, whichever way the captain prefers. And you need that shoreside support where 
the owners can go ashore and do their travelling around the city, you know, so it's not necessarily building a, you know, a hugely expensive marina, but a couple of good mooring, mooring boys and uh, and uh, some short shoreside areas where you can pull up. And would storage be uh, something handy um, if if you can't even provide the berth, but a mooring sort of scenario? But if you had some storage capacity upland, would that help as well? Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, I think so. Um, it's uh, once again, it, it gets back to say what I was talking about, say with the Brisbane River. That's probably going to be more of a short-term stay. The owner visits, and then if the owner goes, the, the crew are going to come possibly down to here or something where they can actually hang out do some jobs on the boat, live that sort of normal life. But, uh, um, but yeah. It fa fair to say that the crew are not going to enjoy being at anchor or at a mooring. Um, they, they're going to have a much better time at a facility. So I if, you, if you do have to put someone at a mooring or at anchor, um, you know, provide some services from the marina. Give them a car. Um, you know, make sure that the tender's got a, a, a berth to come and back from, uh, keep coming back from. If you can run a tender service for them, um, do that. But um, funnel them through your facility to use your shoreside um, facilities and, um, you know, try and give them as much of the same service that you would if they were in your marina. Um, and, and, you know, they'll appreciate it. You, you, you know. They're not going to prefer that, but you know, as much as you can do to give them that service um, that you would, you're still advertising your customer service. You know, maybe not your facility because you you might have too many vessels in there and you can't fit them in. I think uh, be very clear to the captains what you can and can't offer. Um, don't promise anything. Uh, if you can't deliver it, that's that's important. Um, the other thing is to do your homework. Um, make sure you've got contacts for fresh food suppliers. Fresh food suppliers know how to get in there. Um, have all that information ready when the vessel comes in. Keep in mind, if they're international, that's what we're talking here, they don't know anybody. Uh, line them up, have a dockside barbecue, get the crew introduced to, to other crew if you've got them. Or even um, have, a, have a, uh, almost a compendium ready for where they can go. You might not have a gym on site, but there might be a gym within five minutes. Um, make sure that your suppliers understand or the suppliers fresh food suppliers what are the specifics on a super yacht it needs to be cry -vacked. it needs to be individual packaged it needs to be labeled it's different than just going to woolies and and, and buy a couple of kilos of steak um, and there the requirements are much higher on a super yacht and i think a, a marina manager can prepare for all of that in advance yeah. is it uh, especially for a marina that doesn't regularly uh, service this sort of uh, this part of the market or the industry is it a matter of should they really get on the phone or try to forge a relationship with, um, depending on where they are, like yourself uh, down in Sydney, uh, Rob up up north, uh, and and try to leverage at times and, and get the experience. So uh, the the common theme that keeps coming through here is provision of service, servicing these guys correctly. And if you haven't done it before, that's sometimes it's hard to to understand where that 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 level is, I would, I would assume. And um, so it, would, would if someone called you, Clemens, would you uh, divulge the, um, the information? Um, if somebody would call me, I'd, I'd really try to establish the personal network. I want to know who I'm dealing with. Yep. And at the same time, the captain knows who he's dealing with. So that network, that network creation is more important. Once that's established, Selling your facilities is a lot easier. Yeah. And Dave, with uh, I mean, we've been through the Coastal Trading Act and that, but what what other things can the, the uh, from local government, uh, state, uh, probably f maybe federal, what what can they do to really open up or lubricate the um, the vessels coming into uh, Australia and then into the individual regions? What what things do you think uh, could uh, could be done? Uh, look, I'll, I'll use Cairns as an example because I think they do it quite well, um, even though that's where I'll, I was for the last 13 years. Um, the, the local government in Cairns um, provides funding to the super yacht group Great Barrier Reef for marketing. Um, the, how that was achieved is uh, a presentation was done to the, the councillors and uh, a slide was put up that um, the group had used a number of times 
But instead of talking about the vessels, which is a habit that we all in the boating industry are interested in the boat, um, we didn't talk about the boat. We pointed to every ute that was on the wharf servicing those vessels and who owned it. And the councillors around the room knew every one of those small businesses. Um, so we opened their eyes to the fact that every time a vessel pulls into a port, it doesn't have to go up to a, uh, a shipyard for there to be a whole lot of utes parked around it and work being done. So CANS um, provide uh, a, a marketing fund towards the local group that they then use to go to places such as Tahiti, Fiji, Singapore, Monaco and Fort Lauderdale to attract more vessels to come to that town. Uh, the state government in Queensland is, um, you know, they're on board, they understand it. The hardest thing that, um, that I've got to do is to educate bureaucrats and politicians that super yachts is not a dirty word, it's not about the billionaire owner, um, they all tend to shy away from it. Um, Queensland government have got a super yacht strategy and they have appointed uh, a politician to be the super yacht champion. Now, Michael Healy um, is the member for Cairns, so he's, he's the, the man that an was anointed and he was quite uncomfortable with that term um, when he was first given it until we did a tour of the yards and he saw the amount of small family owned businesses that are involved in this industry. So um, it, it's an education process for these politicians. I have the same problem when I go down to Canberra. You know, I'll quite often cover up the super yacht logo and say I'm here from uh, the marine exporters because they're far more um, conducive to talking to me about export and that's the industry we're in. Um, these vessels come in, we do work on them um, that's export work. There's foreign dollars coming into Australia uh, for that. So, uh, local government they can support local groups and clusters and um, and potentially marinas. The the council down here um, in the Gold Coast uh, are quite supportive of what's happening with the Spit Master Plan and uh, the Southport Yacht Club. Uh, the state government in Queensland is leading the way. We need to get some of the other states on board. West Australia, um, they get it, they understand it. They've seen the jobs that are created down in Henderson um, and they've spoken to us about putting uh, floating in infrastructure to uh, keep in two key locations that will hopefully provide a stepping stone from the cruising grounds in the north at Kimberleys down to their yards down at Henderson. So there, there's talk, it, it'll be dual hatted with um, providing infrastructure for cruise ships but uh, floating infrastructure at Exmouth and at Geraldton, which you know, would tick the box as far as I can see as, as far as giving a stepping stones. The Northern Territory Government, you know, straight after this, I've got to jump on a plane and head up to Darwin because the Northern Territory Government want to talk about what they can do to put in infrastructure in, in Darwin because they've noticed that there's a lot of vessels uh, that mainly touring the Kimberleys and Darwin um, doesn't have adequate uh, facilities for those vessels. Um, they've got a 7.7 .7 metre tidal range and so they need um, decent floating infrastructure for those vessels to be comfortable alongside if they want them to stay for any length of time. Um, New South Wales, I think uh, Clements and I have got a, a lot of work to do with the New South Wales government. Um, they, they haven't... Um, shown a lot of interest in our industry and I think that that's just a, a you know whether we can get to the key people and educate them about how many jobs this this involves maybe take them down to city city marine and show them the amount of people in high-vis vests working on these vessels uh, sorry sorry to tap in there we also seem to uh, have some conflicting interests on wharf space with cruise ships as you know, cruising has, uh, has increased significantly. Um, ships coming in pretty much every day, dumping 2,500 tourists on the shores. Those tourists do spend, not as much per person as what a super yacht guest would spend. Um, but it's, it's comfortable, and I think that's, that's an issue that we need to address. And how can we, how can we better that mix between super yachts and cruise ships?
yeah, just one point, I guess, on the expenditure. And, you know, we look at billions and billions, but if you break it down to a boat, sometimes that makes it a little more palatable or easy to understand. So one of the yachts that I ran, which was 50 metres, we were spending five million US dollars a year. This is not trickle down economics, it's a flood. And it's one of the few things that a lot of these people that are extremely wealthy, even if they charter, they'll never make money on it. So if somebody doesn't like billionaires, well, get the super yachts in here because it's the one thing that they spend the money and won't make money back. They're going to spend the money somewhere. Why not have it here? Because those yachts are out there every day and if you drag them here, they're going to spend it here instead of somewhere else. No, that's a good point. Uh, well, each just a, a quick summary or one takeaway from uh, or, or things that the, the room could take away from your experiences or all the discussion points we've had. Rob, starting with you. Uh, starting with me. Well, I learned a lot from you guys, so that's great. Uh, um, thank you. Um, and for our experience, we were kind of thrust into this position, and I'm um, sure there's things we would do differently. It's something to consider. If you have the water, if you've got the access, it's definitely worth considering and then looking at how you can repurpose or, or find a different way of using that infrastructure um, if super yachts aren't there year round. Yeah, look, you know, if you've got the ability to put in super yachts um, into your marina, let's have a discussion. Um, I'm happy to work for you to bring those vessels and make you money. Um, that's the job I'm charged with is basically to attract more vessels to Australia to use our facilities and for them to stay here longer. Uh, the, the way that we'll go about doing it is we'll act collectively with the whole of the South Pacific when we're in the Northern Hemisphere. So we go to uh, shows like Monaco, Fort Lauderdale, we will um, then, once they're in the Pacific, we want to make sure that they travel around. We don't want them just going to one location. Um, we want them to see the whole region. So it's in our best interest to work with Fiji, Tahiti, New Zealand, Vanuatu, Papua New Guinea, uh, Indonesia, because we want those vessels to actually see all, all that region. And um, we know that they're going to spend a lot of time down here doing refit. Um, which is really our position of strength. Um, and that's where the money is, um, that's where they're going to spend the big dollars, and that's where the jobs are. So if you've got the ability to put in super yacht berths, um, come and have a chat. I agree with that. My message would be if you, if you are prepared to commit to super yachts, do it well. Use the, uh, the knowledge that's in the group. We're all working together here. I'm more than happy to pick up the phone and, and, and give advice, and I, I know that there's others in the room who do exactly the same. But if you commit to it, do it well, um, and don't let the efforts go down the gurgle, because we don't want super yachts leaving Australia who've had a bad experience. Yeah, just touching on that, it's still a, a, a small industry in many ways, because it's a few players, even though there's a lot of money involved. So. Um, Make sure that the stay is good, otherwise the reputation goes out pretty quickly that somebody's had a bad experience. Um, obviously, most of you have got great web pages. Uh, one thing I would say is make sure you put your latitude and your longitude somewhere clearly so that when a guy is overseas, not familiar with here, he can put that into his electronics chart system and start to work out how he's going to get there, what other things are around. So that's that's actually uh, really helpful, having the, the lat, lat and long. Um, Look after the crew and service, service, service. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you to the whole panel here from Mark, Clemens, David and Rob. I'd like to yeah, personally thank and, and some, I think some great insights uh, to that. Uh, and, and Mark, yeah, uh, yeah, 50 metres, 5 million in a, in a year sort of expenditure. That's just a, that's an easy way to break it down, as you say. The, that value that'll go basically funnelling through your marina to the local community. You know, so it's not all about the marina, it's uh, exactly what uh, Clemens and Rob and Dave were saying. It's going to all these local businesses, the bakeries, so small, the amount of small businesses that benefit out of this and getting them on board to deliver that quality um, provisioning uh, is, a, is extremely important too, that, that selection. But thank you guys and, uh, and thank you for everyone who's, uh, who's attended uh, the room. I hope you got something out of that. There's a, there's a little... Uh,